There will be interpretation for this event, so if you need to hear in English, please get interpretation. Um, <laughs> that's that. Sorry, I can't think of the word. Over here. Well, I'm going to sit down there.
everyone. Oh, come on. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, that's what I like to hear. I know it has been a long week and we're halfway through, but I really appreciate you joining us here to um, talk about such an important topic. And um, just a reminder, we will be having speakers in English, Spanish, and Portuguese today with us. Uh, so I think everyone in the room, from what I saw, got interpretation equipment. And we're really here to talk about um, scaling up access to um, finance for indigenous peoples and local communities. And we have, um, we're having sort of two panels, one with our, with indigenous leaders here who have been working both with the uh, Climate Investment Fund's dedicated grant mechanism for indigenous peoples and local communities, and also the Jeff Inclusive Conservation Initiative. Um, and these um, mechanisms, um, the Climate Investment Fund's dedicated grant mechanism for indigenous peoples and local communities, or the DGM, was sort of the forerunner to direct investment for indigenous peoples. Um, in, in 12 countries, over $70 million going to support initiatives of indigenous peoples and local communities. On the other hand, we also have the Jeff 7 Inclusive Conservation Initiative, which is more recent, and it was a $25 million commitment from the Global Environmental Facility to support indigenous-led initiatives. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus this session on talking with our indigenous leaders here who have been participating in both of these um, financing initiatives. Then we'll hear from um, some of the executing agencies who have been working on that. And we're also going to hear from the Climate Investment Fund and the Jeff about their experience. Huh? No. Okay. Um, so I first, I want to turn to Nima, who's here, is here with me from Kenya, uh, not Kenya, <laughs> Tanzania, sorry, um, and is working with UCRT in the Jeff Inclusive Conservation Initiative. And I'd love to hear from your perspectives, the priorities that you've set out, how you're working, and what this financing and the learning of this financing has done for you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Neymar Michael Lakule from Tanzania, working with an organization called the Ujama Community Resource Team, found in the northern part of Tanzania. It is a grassroots organization uh, working with pastoralism, hunter gatherers, and agro pastoralism. Uh, our main work is seeking to improve the livelihood of the both. Uh, communities uh, in order for them to be able to manage, uh, control, and to use the natural resource that they used to manage for several, several years and benefit from them. USRT as an organization as addressing the land loss issues, which is the most issues that is uh, difficult for pastoralism because they live in mobili mobility life, like they are shifting from one place to another, looking for pasture. But also, it was hard for them to manage their land as it is. Hence, the hunter-gatherers lost their 90% 90, 90 of their land. And it is where now UCRT intervene, say, how can we do to help this uh, pastoral community so that they can manage their land in a sustainable way. So by doing so, they introduce what we call land use plan, where they try to demarcate their areas, especially the uh, grazing areas, because for them, they live in communal life. And also the framework of our government allow the, the communal uh, legal, legal, legal document that will be pro produced to those community for them to manage e their resources in a sustainable way and to get the certificate that enable them to, to have the mandate of being there for what we call certificate of customary right of occupants. Uh, now, through uh, GF7 Inclusive Conservation, we enhance uh, 
indigenous people and local community effort to steward the land, a natural resource, to deliver the global environmental benefit. As we know, the indigenous have been managing their area several years, uh, and they have their knowledge, their skills of, man of managing those areas. So we scale up, uh, emphasize, and capacitate them to be able to manage their biodiversity uh, and the ecosystem that they used to live for several times. But through the ICI, we have three clusters that we target. The three clusters, we have uh, the, what we call the legal securing communal land tenure that we secure in three clusters, Manjiro cluster, Longdo clusters, and the Aeda clusters. We want the community, we want the pastoral hunter-gatherers community to manage the land and also to benefit from the land that they are managing. But also, uh, we want the, the women to be part and parcel of being able to control, to manage, and benefit from the land. We want them to be in different decision-making bodies. So we formulate what we call Women's Right and Leadership Forum in the grassroots. They are trying to advocate women rights and support women to be in different decision-making bodies. Since in the local community, women are not given priority. Either if they are in the general meeting, they are not allowed to stand up, express their, themselves. They are not allowed to, to contest different leadership position, which is very important for women voice to be heard. But also the issue of land ownership. Women are not allowed to own the land just because they are women. But through the ICI inclusive project, it is where now we are going to, to capacitate the community that women have right to own the land and they have right to make decision in natural resource that they manage and also to benefit from. And through ICI, uh, the land that is being secured is 7.5 hectares of pastoralism and hunter-gatherers. But also, we have 39,000 people who are benefiting through this project. So we see how the project will improve the livelihood for pastoralism and hunter-gatherers. But also through this project, women are going to be empowered in issues regarding to community microfinance groups. We want them to engage in several business that can help them to overcome the climate, climate change impact. Because climate have, big, uh, have been a big problem nowadays, and the most affected group are women and youth. Men are usually running away from home, went to other places, looking at other alternatives to survive, but women are usually the one who they stay at home, take care of their children without nothing. So we are proud of being women, that despite the climate is coming, we won't run out of our children. We have to care and to look out how to do. But also, we want women to, to engage in beehives, that we have uh, the, the nature, the forest. We, we want them to get some honey, sell, and get some money to, to, to support them in their, in their family. But also through the project, we are going to manage the protection areas, especially water, water areas. We know our life depends on the ecosystem, and no way you can separate the, the people with the biodiversity, with the ecosystem, that their life depends. So uh, I can say with the ICI project, it is the one of the projects that directed fund to local people and the indigenous people, and I conquer that uh, the direct finance is free for thriving ecosystem and thriving community. The direct finance should uh, respond to the, the needs 
and the demand of the people, but also the, the need, the, the money, the accessing money should go directly to indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you, Nima. Um, I think you raised some important points. The investments of the Jeff Inclusive Conservation Initiative is between one and two million dollars in, in these projects, and yours is seven point million hectares of land and 39,000 Maasai who were in that area. And I think you've highlighted the importance of the legal aspect of tenure, um, the important voice of women in managing those resources, and really the impacts of climate change and how that's transforming your community. I'm gonna turn to Lucas now um, to also share a little bit about his experience. And in, in Guatemala and in Panama, you're all working as a consortium with indigenous leadership in Guatemala and in Panama, and you come from the organization Actina Mit in Guatemala. Can you share a little bit about your experience and the process you all went through to develop your strategy for inclusive conservation? Muy bien. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Lucas Che, eh, soy Maya Echi. Soy de Guatemala y estoy representando a Actenamit en este espacio. Para mí es un gusto poder compartir las experiencias que tenemos, eh, sobre todo la, como comunidad indígena. Bueno, hablo eh, primero de las comunidades indígenas de América Latina y, y del Caribe. Pero en especial voy a eh, dar énfasis a la experiencia de las iniciativas que Actenamit ha impulsado, ¿verdad? En torno a la, al financiamiento de la, del clima y de la biodiversidad. En caso particular, eh, Actenamit es una organización maya, indígena, que se sitúa en Guatemala, que tiene más de 30 años de experiencia trabajando con jóvenes de áreas rurales y de escasos recursos. Eh, tiene una junta directiva que es, que es la que gestiona todos los, los, los apoyos, toda lo, la, la, la parte administrativa y técnica necesaria para el funcionamiento. En este caso, eh, a través de la junta directiva, pues Actenamit ha podido movilizar recursos para poder cumplir con los objetivos que tiene planteado como pueblo indígena. Y uno de esos ejemplos es que eh, Actanamit, a través de su equipo de junta directiva y su equipo de incidencia, ha movilizado recursos, como el del gobierno de Guatemala, en este caso eh, nos han otorgado 1.2 millones de dólares para impulsar el programa educativo. Eh, y adicionalmente, para cumplir, porque no solamente es en ese tema, porque el, nosotros la, el tema educativo que tenemos le damos un, un, un import, una importancia, un plus, ¿verdad?, en torno al cambio climático, porque eh, eh, también ha gestionado, ha movilizado recursos para poder, poder cumplir con esa, con esa metodología. Eh, uno es con, digamos, con los, las iniciativas eh, de mecanismos, mecanismos de financiamientos. En este caso, uno es un ejemplo particular es de GDM y también las, y la, la iniciativa de conservación inclusive. También tenemos iniciativas en ese proceso y que para nosotros como institución ha venido a fortalecer nuestras capacidades. Pero sin embargo, necesitamos, en este caso, Mencionar que, aunque sí están las iniciativas, ¿verdad? Que están los mecanismos de financiamiento para las comunidades indígenas y para las comunidades locales, eh, es importante resaltar que dentro de esas iniciativas se identifique un aporte que es necesario para fortalecer las capacidades de los liderazgos de las organizaciones, ¿verdad? Aunque eh, con eso no quiere decir que, o, o no quiero decir que las comunidades o las organizaciones no tengan las capacidades. Bien, tienen las capacidades, 
Sin embargo, está basado de acuerdo a sus experiencias, está basado de acuerdo a su costumbre, de acuerdo a sus tradiciones y, por supuesto, a través de sus experiencias ancestrales. Y es ahí donde la comunidad internacional o la cooperación entra para fortalecer esas capacidades que ya están. Y es importante porque las comunidades indígenas tengan esas capacidades de eh, llevar a cabo sus acciones en torno al cambio climático. Eh, en este caso, Actinamit, como mencioné, ya tiene 30 años de experiencia, tiene las capacidades, tiene la, la, las capacidades administrativas y técnicas, sin embargo, es importante fortalecerla. Y eso va a contribuir a acelerar las acciones que tiene y también ampliar su cobertura de, 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 de acción, ¿verdad? Aunque en Guatemala, como estoy hablando particularmente de Actenamitan, en Guatemala, eh, el, el campo de trabajo de Actenamit es, es bastante amplio, porque está trabajando con 11 de los 22 departamentos que tiene Guatemala. Los estudiantes que atienden a través de su centro educativo vienen de esas comunidades, de 11 departamentos. Entonces, sí atiene campo pero sí necesita impulsar acciones para poder asegurar que los jóvenes que salgan dentro de ese, dentro de ese modelo educativo puedan contribuir a ampliar las acciones que se hacen a favor del clima, a favor de la biodiversidad. biodiversidad ¿verdad? Eh, también, en este caso, como eso lo hacemos en el marco, primero el, la gestión que hacemos con el gobierno es en el marco del de cumplimiento de los acuerdos de paz. Y lo que hacemos a nivel internacional con las cooperaciones internacionales y que están basados en la conservación eh, y la protección del, del ambiente o de la tierra, de la naturaleza también, lo hacemos porque nosotros le damos, como mencioné anteriormente, le damos un plus a nuestro modelo, que no solamente nos basamos en formar a jóvenes, porque también queremos contribuir el cumplimiento de los acuerdos de París, que está basado en, la, en, en este caso en el cumplimiento de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Entonces, que los jóvenes, como mencioné, sean protagonistas de sus comunidades, salgan de un modelo educativo y que ese modelo educativo les permita realmente prepararse y poder llegar a sus comunidades y ellos promover acciones que les ayuda y que ayuda a sus comunidades, a su familia, poder adaptarse a, a, a esos procesos de, de adaptación a los riesgos que hay ¿verdad? En, to, en torno al cambio climático. Entonces, y por eso es muy importante para nosotros que las cooperaciones, o, y no solamente las cooperaciones, porque también son las comunidades indígenas que se unan esos esfuerzos y esos esfuerzos, pues eh, ambos, pues tenemos de ganar, ¿verdad? Las comunidades indígenas y comunidades locales y también las cooperaciones. Y si, como estamos hablando también de, las, eh, de la ampliación de la financiación de las iniciativas de las comunidades indígenas, pues al momento de asegurar y fortalecer las capacidades de las comunidades indígenas, también la, la, la comunidad internacional, en este caso los donantes, pues aseguran y genera más confianza porque saben que a través de sus mecanismos se están fortaleciendo las capacidades de las comunidades indígenas y eso genera más confianza pues para que los recursos se ejecuten de manera transparente y que se cumpla con los objetivos que se tiene, tanto de las comunidades y como también de la comunidad internacional. Así que muchas gracias. Gracias. Um, I think you made some excellent points because you're talking about the leadership of your organization and you're talking oh. <laughs> uh, you're talking about the leadership of your organization but how your organization is trying to harmonize financing that your organization is trying to harmonize financing from the dedicated grant mechanism for indigenous peoples and local communities through the Jeff inclusive conservation initiative and also with your recent uh, funds coming from the government of Guatemala and the focus that you have is really bringing youth and that next generation and looking at those issues. 
Um, Alfredo, I'm going to go to Alfredo Vargas now, who is uh, the head of FENAMAT in, in Peru, um, also working with inclusive conservation. Um, Want to hear a little bit about the experience that FENAMAT is doing working with communities in the Amazon basin. Gracias. Bueno, primero agradecer este espacio eh, Alfredo Vargas Pío, presidente de FENAMAT, de la región de Madre Dios, un ente representativo de 48 comunidades, 8 pueblos de la Amazonía peruana, en este caso de la región de Madre Dios. Eh, para nosotros es muy importante este, este proyecto porque va a eh, empoderar ¿no? las comunidades locales, va a ser muy importante el trabajo que se viene haciendo de cómo podemos liderar ¿no? estos espacios que ya, en, ya sí han sido financiados, pero eh, por intermediarios, ¿no? había siempre intermediarios, pero este proyecto ahora va a engrandecer, va a fortalecer aún más el, el trabajo de FENAMAT, hablando en ese tema, eh, Coimbamat, Cuardima, que son eh, organizaciones intermedias de FENAMAT en la región de Madre Dios. Sé que también la iniciativa es a nivel de los que son parte de este, de este proyecto, para nosotros es una experiencia y un reto a la vez. Y como FENAMAT estamos seguros de lograr y fortalecer más aún el liderazgo de los jóvenes, de las mujeres, ¿no? que son parte de nuestra federación. Y de verdad también un agradecimiento a Luis, que es parte de este equipo, igual a Cristin, son parte de este equipo y de verdad para nosotros es un proyecto que va a fortalecer aún más y va a fortalecer eh, cómo podemos nosotros eh, eh, trabajar en grupos grandes de pueblos, hablando de naciones antes eh, las comunidades eh, son porción de tierras tituladas, pero pequeños espacios, ¿no? Ahora va a permitirnos trabajar por pueblos, por naciones, y eso va a garantizar más, va a garantizar más el, el empoderamiento de respeto a la inviabilidad de derechos cómo defendemos el bosque, en la defensa de los bosques en la actualidad. Hace cinco días, a seis días, líder indígena que protege, defiende los bosques, ha sido asesinado en Perú y eso no puede amilanar a nosotros como líderes indígenas, aún más fortalecernos y de verdad, ¿qué más con este, este proyecto vamos a empoderar nuestras capacidades? Es muy importante en tiempo de pandemia, por ejemplo, los pueblos indígenas han sido eh, grandes este, desde su ancestralidad, han podido, líderes indígenas no han, no han fallecido, ¿no? Entonces, sin embargo, los que están fuera de estos espacios han fallecido mucho, ¿no? Entonces, ¿eso qué significa? Significa que eh, con este, estos proyectos vamos a empoderar más nuestras capacidades en esos espacios territoriales. El tema de liderazgo de mujer es muy importante porque la mujer juega un papel muy importante en la conservación de los bosques los jóvenes líderes, lideresas que se van a empoderar aún más y con este, este proyecto y hacer ver la capacidad que tienen los indígenas para poder este, manejar proyectos grandes y se pueda ahí más 
fortalecer, ¿no? Entonces, eh, ahora es directo el trabajo, entonces ya no hay intermediario. No digo que estuvo mal, sino ahora el trabajo es más directo y entonces se puede ahí fortalecer más las capacidades de las comunidades locales, ¿no? Eh, y el cambio climático es un tema que en la actualidad, eh, eh, cómo se adaptan la, las comunidades, cómo se adaptan los que viven en esos bosques a este tema mundial. Pienso o pensamos los indígenas, protejamos los bosques, pero protejamos todos, porque para todos se protege el bosque, no solamente para los pueblos indígenas, para el mundo. Defendamos la vida, defendamos nuestra vida, a que la vida sea más que el poder económico eh, eh, y que es muy difícil hablando de Perú, hay mucha violación de derechos, no pero ahí estamos y con este proyecto ICI nosotros vamos a empoderar más nuestras capacidades y podamos afrontar y mitigar también el cambio climático. Gracias. Thank you, Alfredo. Um, I think in terms of an indigenous federation in the Amazon, you're talking about how you are all together working to consolidate these resources you have to work across your communities. And I know you just highlighted that we lost a leader a few days ago as they were protecting uh, their land, their territory and, and their environment. So I think these resources in terms of helping to support your capacity and then removing the inter intermediary and helping those capacities continue to grow is an important aspect. Daniel Lourdes, I'm gonna to turn to you now. And you're with the Red de Sajado, and you have participated in the dedicated grant mechanism for indigenous peoples and local communities. And I think I heard you say that you've been with the Red de Sajado for 40 years. I believe I heard that in the conversation. And I want to hear from you, since you've been with an organization a long time, how has been your experience with the dedicated grant mechanism and how has that helped the work that you have done in the Red de Sajado? Tell us a little bit about it. Boa tarde para todos e todas. Eu sou coordenadora da Rede Cerrado, né, como acabou de ser falado aqui. E também sou uma das conselheiras nacional do DGM Brasil. Vocês estão me ouvindo? Então, essa experiência para para nós ela é única. Primeiro, eu queria começar agradecendo o DGM Brasil pela oportunidade que nos deu de ter investido na, na no Bioma Cerrado que a gente trabalha, trabalha, sempre acompanha e apoia os investimentos da Amazônia e nega esquece também das necessidades do Cerrado. E o DGM é, é, nos deu essa oportunidade de trabalhar com esse bioma. E os resultados nossos, lembrando que, que eu não sou uma conselheira que entrei no DGM do início, isso é só para dizer que se fosse um do início, tinha mais experiência tinha experiência a mais do que eu, o que eu vou falar aqui. E nós temos experiências fantásticas. Né? Uma delas é poder ter o protagonismo das mulheres no DGM Global, né? no DGM Brasil. Também poder ter a oportunidade de desenvolver um plano de manejo né? no, no bioma, no agroestativismo e também na, na questão da, da biodiversidade. Isso é, isso é muito importante na vida de toda a população e de todos nós. Lembrando também que as capacitações, nós, nós temos o prazer de dizer que os recursos chegam aonde ninguém nunca tinha visto recurso, é, recurso nenhum. Né? E esse até é estrangeiro que chegou até lá. Né? O, o recurso do DGM Brasil, que chegou em comunidade, que nunca tinha recebido recurso nenhum. E dessa capacidade, a gente vê jovens sendo capacitados e hoje fazendo gestão. E assim, com muita honra dizer assim, que além da gestão dos próprios projetos, ainda ajudar no projeto de outras comunidades. Então, a capacitação que a gente passou, que o DGM nos deu a oportunidade 
de executar nas bases, tem nos dado um resultado muito positivo. A capacitação com relação a, 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 as energias renováveis né, da fotovoltaica, que também capacitamos jovens, mulheres, quilombolas, mulher, pessoas de todas as idades, que foi feita a capacitação. E aí a gente pensa, né? Como que a gente deixaria um projeto, um, um, um investimento desse, sem, sem pedir mais investimento? Né? A capacidade que foi dada para esse povo se capacitar, em organizar, melhorar e ampliar os seus investimentos na base, um investimento sustentável, transformar a agricultura né, familiar num, num processo sustentável. Então, nós precisamos de ampliação desses investimentos. Por quê? Porque foi trabalhado primeiro a capacitação. Né, e hoje a gente tem condição, desses que foram capacitados, capacitamos as organizações também, né, muita associação que não tinha condição de receber o recurso porque eles estavam irregular, foram trabalhados também, regularizado e hoje outras pessoas recebendo recursos também por esse aporte né, nas comunidades indígenas e nas comunidades tradicionais, povos e comunidades tradicionais. O nosso conselho ele é feito de uma forma muito interessante para fazer os investimentos na base. Como é que ele é feito? Primeiro, a gente senta o conselho, né, que é formado por indígenas, povos e populações tradicionais, que lá tem quilombola, tem catingueiro, tem, tem o geraizeiro, a quebradeira de coco e os indígenas. A maior parte do conselho é indígena. Né? A gente trabalha no, no Brasil 60 a 40. 60 para os indígenas, 40 para os povos. E, desse jeito, a gente senta também para debater e discutir os critérios. Então, para selecionar o... o os projetos que vão ser selecionados, é, o conselho senta, chama o, 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 a agência executora e a gente diz quais são os critérios que a gente quer que seja colocado nesses editais. A agência lança o edital, depois que recebe os editais, ele vai obedecer, selecionar dentro dos editais aquele que obedece os critérios e passa para o conselho de novo traz para a gente, a gente analisa se foi obedecido todos os critérios, e aí a gente forma uma comissão. Um exemplo, se, o, se a gente for, vai visitar os projetos na base, se o projeto for na, no território quilombola, a gente traz um indígena de outro território, com quilombola local e um técnico para a gente ir lá, ver o projeto, né? ele passou no projeto, mas ele só vai saber que o projeto foi aprovado depois que a gente for lá e analisar na base se realmente eles atendem aqueles critérios que foram colocados. A gente faz né, a visita de campo para poder executar. E vice-versa, né? se for num, ter, num, num território dos povos, é a mesma coisa. Aí vem um indígena de outro território junto com o um técnico para a gente fazer essa visita de base e poder constatar se está atendendo os critérios mesmo. A partir daí que a gente faz o investimento, né? e, e junto com eles, né, para atender as demandas deles, aí tem, nós temos um desafio, que é, acho que, um pouco melhorar a desburocratização. Né? Porque, assim, ó, nós trabalhamos em lugares muito difícil de acesso, muito longe de chegar. Então, muita coisa, nós não temos como fazer, obedecer o critério da, da cotação. Cotação, como é que é a outra palavra que fala? É, é uma tomada de preço em três locais. Né? Então, tem, tem vezes que isso é, é, prejudica um pouco a coisa. E tem uma outra coisa também que fica prejudicada, é o investimento local. Porque se a gente tivesse condição, por exemplo, vamos fazer uma reunião em tal lugar e a gente pudesse consumir os produtos da comunidade, comprar o francaipira da base, comprar a mandioca dali, comprar as coisas da comunidade, isso deixaria mais recursos na base, facilitaria mais, né? ainda investiria mais na base. Então, assim... Tem coisa que a gente sabe que não é possível, maquinário não é possível ser assim, né? mas tem muita coisa que ainda pode ser melhorada. E aí eu digo com todo o prazer né, que eu entrei no meio do projeto, presenciei todos esses, esses investimentos muito bacana, Sou muito, fico muito orgulhosa de fazer parte desse processo, né, porque dentro do, do, 
do DGM, eu fui para lá representando a Rosalino, onde são oito povos, então no Lourdes não fala por ela. Lourdes vai falar para lá, falar fala por oito povos e defender recursos para o lugar que estiver mais adequado para receber esse recurso, estiver mais necessitado, estiver mais precisando. Então, é assim que a gente trabalha e a gente espera né, que os, os projetos sejam ampliados, porque, junto com todo esse trabalho, nós capacitamos outras organizações para receber recursos também. Entre elas, estamos nós, a Rede Cerrado, né, precisando de um recurso também para investir na base, na ampliação. A gente trabalha com três núcleos né, de, da, da biodiversidade. Então, Estamos preparados para executar com muita transparência, com muita vontade e investimento nos povos e populações tradicionais que estão na base. E uma reivindicação que esse recurso seja ampliado para os outros povos, não fique só né, nesses três. Né? Nós temos os catingueiros, temos pampa, temos os outros que também precisam de receber investimento para melhorar a sua qualidade de vida e manter os biomas em pé, que é o mais importante de todo o nosso debate. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, thank you, Dona Lourdes. I don't even know if I can capture everything that you talked about, but you talked about uh, the importance of the investment in the Sahado, because that's often overlooked in many areas, the importance of the governance by indigenous peoples and local communities, and the representation in that and the decision-making process. Um, you talked about the importance of women and empowering women in this effort. Um, And you also talked about how you all want to continue to help other communities. And, and as they say in English, play it forward. How can we help with our own transparency to be able to access better resources and, and for our communities? So I, I just wanted to thank our panel. I think they've given us really um, exciting experiences and cases of the work that they're all doing um, and their leadership here. So I want to give them a round of applause and say thank you. And I'm going to ask our next round of questions. I'll ask you all to take a seat, and I'm going to ask our next panelist to come up and join us. Okay. Um, so now that we've heard a little bit from the various experiences with the DGM and inclusive conservation about the execution of those resources, um, Conservation International and IUCN have been playing roles because they're services agencies of uh, the Global Environmental Facility, but also as agencies of helping with other finances. So I wanted to hear a little bit of the lessons learned um, as we've heard about the leadership that indigenous organizations have been taking and the capacities to administer those resources. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the learning that organizations have as entities, and some may still consider organizations like CI and IUCN as an intermediary, but they also service a role as agencies of different financing. So I'm going to turn to Anita Sek, uh, who's a program officer from IUCN, and uh, Maya as well, um, and also as an indigenous woman working on these issues in the context of an organization. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience um, working with inclusive conservation. Okay, thank you, Chris. Buenas tardes. Como a mí me gusta darle trabajo a los intérpretes, hoy voy a hablar en, en español. Eh, mi nombre es Anita Tzek, soy maya yucateca del oeste de Belice y llevo cuatro años trabajando en UICN, eh, encargada del Programa Global de Pueblos Indígenas y Conservación. Eh, ha sido cuatro años intensos, eh, recuerdo con, con Kristen, yo empecé a trabajar un lunes 15 de septiembre en el 2019 y martes, eh, ya estaba nadando en el mar de nuevas experiencias que es la iniciativa de conservación inclusiva eh, junto con Kristen y Luis de Conservación Internacional. Eh, ha sido un nadar eh, muchas veces fluyendo como el río fluye hacia abajo, río abajo, pero muchas veces nadando hacia arriba contra corriente porque... Eh, la realidad es que nuestras instituciones son instituciones que operan en sistemas, cuadros, 
procesos muy burocráticos que muchas veces eh, no toman en cuenta eh, qué funciona y qué no funciona para los pueblos indígenas, ¿verdad? Eh, yo creo que trabajar en esto ha sido de valientes, eh, ha sido de colaboración como hermanos, en este caso, aludo a Luis y a Kristen, que hemos estado trabajando de hombro a hombro en esta iniciativa, aunque estamos en dos instituciones distintas. El primer paso ha sido cómo asegurarnos de trabajar desde una perspectiva, de un enfoque, de un proceso de que ICI es un solo proyecto. Son dos institu instituciones, pero trabajando como un solo proyecto, creando y construyendo una familia ICI en conjunto con los líderes indígenas que son parte de este proyecto, que son el conocimiento, que son los guías, que son los que gobiernan y toman las decisiones de ICI. Eso ha sido el primer punto, el primer el reto y un reto que hemos acogido y hemos aprendido a trabajar con ello. Eh, segundo, los requisitos, los requisitos que establece el GEF, los requisitos que establece el GCF, los requisitos que establece la comunidad de donantes, muchas veces no son eh, requisitos abiertos, en el sentido de que muchas veces es como una botella y hay un cuello la botella está llena, pero que fluyan esos recursos cuesta mucho. Entonces, hemos aprendido que han habido requisitos que nosotros mismos y nuestras organizaciones han tenido que poner un reto a esto y decir, si el GEF realmente quiere aumentar los recursos que fluyan hacia pueblos indígenas y comunidades locales, hay que abrir esos cuellos de botella, hay que cambiar esos requisitos. Necesitamos hacer más flexibles, necesitamos aprender de lo que ha funcionado para los pueblos indígenas y lo que no ha funcionado y estar dispuestos realmente a cambiar lo que no ha funcionado, porque si no seguiremos hablando de que hay que aumentar, de que hay que involucrar, de que hay que ser incluyentes, pero si no estamos dispuestos a cambiar esos cuellos de botella, seguiremos hablando. Lo otro es eh, la gobernanza por pueblos indígenas. En ICI, el cuerpo de gobernanza es y son los líderes indígenas. Son los que establecen las prioridades, son los que diseñan sus iniciativas y el impacto que tendrán a nivel local en sus comunidades y territorios. Son los que nos dicen, Cristian, Luis y Anita, sí, esto es una buena propuesta, pero por aquí no vamos nosotros, es por el otro lado. Entender eso, reconciliarlo con nuestras instituciones donde estamos y realmente enfocarnos donde importa, en las prioridades de los pueblos indígenas y asegurar que ICI esté cumpliendo también con proteger, con respetar y promover los derechos indígenas. Esa autodeterminación en toma de decisiones, esa autodeterminación en decidir qué sucede y qué no sucede en sus comunidades, en sus territorios. Ha sido clave para ICI. Eh, y bueno, pode, podría seguir con mucho más, pero estoy segura que mi colega Luis tiene su lista de cosas que siempre él comparte porque le encanta y está muy bien todo lo, lo técnico y todos lo, lo, los puentes que hemos tenido que romper y reconstruir todos los loops que hemos tenido que saltar, se los compartirá Luis. Eh, me voy a disculpar porque tengo otro evento donde también me toca hablar y, y necesito correr a ese evento. Como todo está súper lejos aquí, yo ojalá hubiera río porque nadaría en ellos, ¿va? pero no hay ríos aquí. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Thanks, Anita. Ok, Luis, I'm going to turn to you. Thanks, Anita. Um, Luis, I'm going to turn to you because you've, you've not only are working with con inclusive conservation, um, but you've also worked with the dedicated grant mechanism for indigenous peoples and local communities. So it would be important for you to share. I think it needs us at the stage for um, the bottlenecks that we have, but also talk about the learning because the whole process of these projects, not only for our organizations, but with our partners has been learning by doing, right? It's a philosophy. So I'll turn it over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Kristen, and thank you, everyone. I think it, uh, first, I want to recognize and acknowledge also how fascinating has been this first segment of the 
of, of this program of learning uh, from first hand the experiences and also how uh, inspiring all, or, all these activities that are happening on the ground. And um, I think this is a great opportunity also to make a contrast between two initiatives that are on the lens of multilateral climate finance that have started at different moments and that have different uh, lessons learned. Uh, and because they happen at different moments, one is a, a first version, an early mover of, of how to mobilize climate finance, uh, multilateral finance on the perspective of climate and, and now the other one with, with biodiversity, no? but both recognizing that the climate and the biodiversity crisis are two sides of the same coin and therefore uh, community-led solutions offer a, a holistic solution and a holistic approach uh, towards these issues on the ground. And um, as Anita said, we, we've been colla collaborating under the scope of the Inclusive Conservation Initiative as co-implementing accredited agencies to the GEF, supporting the, the, the mobilizations of funding uh, directly to indigenous organizations at higher thresholds. And, and this has been a learning by doing experience. It has been a pilot that um, conventionally through the GEF, the thresholds of funding are uh, or the go-to source of GEF funding for indigenous and local community organizations has been through the Small Grants Program. And this has been a pilot to see how uh, the threshold could go higher and how uh, these results could be also um, con uh, being a, a, a direct contribution and recognition of, um, of the role of, of indigenous territories and local communities towards global environmental benefits. Um, and, and there are many strategies and best practices that we have learned um, uh, in this journey. Um, I'd like to share five of them. I think Anita uh, uh, will complement many of this uh, from Anita, Anita's points. Um, one of them I would start is with the leadership uh, that we, uh, through, the uh, through the steering committee uh, and through exter uh, experience of, of working through a steering committee that consists of indigenous peoples and local community leaders giving us the vision, the strategy, the direction, and also um, the, the way forward um, has been, I think, a, a game changer here. The other one is also how this is aligned and engaged through the IPO constituencies at both conventions of the CBD and the climate conventions, and how this connection also help us to um, uh, bring all these lessons learned that are happening on projects and, and see how these are being reflected and informed in this type of areas at the international level and, the, and on the other way around as well. Um, the other one is when it comes to, uh, to project design, uh, where I think we have to break some silos there and think about how uh, to go beyond the conventional measurement of indicators. Um, we have experience through the to the Inclusive Conservation Initiative, how uh, to help build a stronger connection to global environmental benefits, but also tell a, a broader story that goes beyond hectares, beyond carbon, and beyond uh, the term that conventionally uh, it's called beneficiaries, but in practice for us is partners in conservation. And uh, with this, I think um, it has helped us also uh, tell a story that uh, has come from the projects uh, themselves, how um, each organization is trying to build a more holistic story about how these activities uh, go beyond these, uh, these traditional and conventional, these conventional indicators. Uh, my third point is related to the nexus of uh, the climate and biodiversity nexus and uh, how this contribution to the goals of both climate and biodiversity, um, this this is a holistic approach and also um, it requires different pathways to mobilize finance. This is one of them. Uh, it's, it's one related to multilateral finance, but there are others. And, and diversifying those pathways of, or, and complementarity of those pathways, I think we learn also from the previous segment uh, and experiences of, of projects on the ground. Uh, and the fourth point, uh, it's about the access and adaptability to meet donor requirements. Um, it's a, a process that it has been a, a challenging and it has also made us challenge our internally in our organizations to keep transforming uh, and, and, and keep rethinking and adapting processes to the scope, to the size and the purpose of, of, 
of the initiatives that are are being developed and address bottlenecks uh, throughout the way, no, of how to to build efficiencies in that in, in that trajectory. Uh, and the last is the element of harmonization and collaboration. This is where I think uh, we're learning to build also effectiveness uh, in both in experiences where uh, there are opportunities of co-finance and complementarity uh, beyond uh, the funding that comes from multilateral finance, uh, but also in building formats that could speak and comply with a different type, a different donors, but at the same time, a, keep us, uh, giving us an opportunity to stream, streamline and simplify processes. Um, and uh, last but not least, I think my final takeaway here is also the element of, of the purpose of this uh, uh, event, which is access and scale, which are very important, uh, definitely. Uh, um, this, is, uh, this is an urgent matter to address. Uh, to bridge that gap between uh, of access to climate finance, uh, but I think there are other factors also to keep into account uh, to 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 reach that uh, outcome uh, to the, that climate climate and biodiversity outcome. And I think, in that sense, it goes in 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 the areas of diversifying sources of funding, um, finding different mo uh, modalities of finance to achieve long-term sustainability, and also building a strong and diverse partnerships for this purpose. Thank you. Thanks, Luis. Um, I think you've highlighted a number of comments. I think it's, it's we want to move beyond those bottlenecks, um, the diversification of, of the types of funding, but also how do we create those formats that make that finance much more accessible. So I'm going to turn now to Paul Hartman, who's with the Climate Investment Fund, and Gabriella Richardson with the Global Environmental Facility, um, to hear some of their reflections as, as multilateral agencies who are helping to provide this finance um, and access it. And, and, and you've heard from our leaders, you've heard from the organizations, it'd be good to hear some of your reflections about how you're thinking about the way forward, the lessons learned, and so forth. I'll go to Paul. Great, thanks, Kristen. Um, so I represent the Climate Investment Funds, which is a big multilateral fund uh, trying to address climate change. Traditionally not a viewed as a funder of indigenous people and local communities. Um, but when my organization was setting up a sustainable forest management program. The indigenous observers uh, on our board wanted to push away from the traditional view of indigenous people and local communities as beneficiaries of funding to one where they were active participates, participants in the solutions. So no longer was it enough to be engaged uh, to, to benefit from, to be advised, they wanted to have a stake. Um, and this led to the creation of the DGM. Now, given that communities uh, manage 500 million hectares of forests that store 37 billion tons of carbon, it makes sense to engage those communities in the management of forests if you're trying to address the challenges of climate change. And the other thing that we heard from the speakers previously was, if not IPLCs, then who? Who is gonna be willing to risk their life to protect those forests? Uh, who has the local knowledge who's gonna be there for 40 years with an organization? Um, this morning I sat in a, on a, in a meeting where uh, an indigenous leader from Ecuador sued uh, an oil company that was trying to strip their land rights uh, and won. Uh, so who, who is able to do that? Um, so I think from a perspective of the need for the engagement of IPLCs in order to achieve our climate goals, it's really critical. The challenges that Luis has mentioned are real. This is a very difficult process uh, and there are a lot of bottlenecks along the way. What I think we've learned, because um, we work through the World Bank uh, who then funded Conservation International, and then uh, the grants went down uh, to the IPLCs at the country level. The World Bank requires a lot of rigor. They require a lot of safeguards. They view this as having a very high transaction cost. Some of the communities viewed this as being very slow. Um, nonetheless, at the end of the day, the World Bank 
viewed this as important to what they were doing and are now taking on the global lead of the new DGM program that we have in, a, in the next iteration of this program, uh, Nature-Based Solutions. And not only are they interested, but other multilateral development banks are interested in playing this role. So the takeaway is that it, I think what's required in some sense is a change of perspective. The change away from a view of this being a necessary thing to do to support indigenous people, local communities, um, for it's necessary for moral reasons, but it's, it's really necessary to achieve the goals that we want to have for climate change. We will not hit our 1.5 degree goals without engaging indigenous people and local communities. And the more donors start to understand that, I think the more we will be able to deal with these bottlenecks. Thanks. Okay, Gabrielle, I'll turn to you. Thank you, and thank you for this great uh, event. This is really exciting for me to be here today. So uh, I'm Gabriela richardson Tem. I'm with, with the Global Environment Facility. Uh, there I've been working on issues on gender equality, stakeholder engagement, civil society, and all of these very uh, important issues. And for me, it is, is even the more exciting time because with our new JEP8 programming, we have really for, uh, push forward with a whole of society approach, really an inclusive approach to conservation and for for uh, the work that we do. And I, I think that that sort of sets us in, in a different place where we have been before. But I, I wanted to maybe start a little bit where you ended. Uh, you know, when you are a global environment a facility, uh, we are then the, the uh, financial mechanism for many conventions. We are governed by decisions that are made at the COP. We are governed by our council. We have to, we are, we are providing money from, we are getting money from public financing. So we have barriers ourselves of what we can do. And the GEF is, has traditionally in, uh, in, in our instrument is really government to government financing. So we operate within that framework and context. But so having that said, I am so bad, I should put it even closer. So having that said, that within the context that we operate, I think what the Jeff has done very early on was recognizing the importance of local communities, indigenous peoples, the issues on gender equality, the issues of really engaging civil society in order to deliver on the global environment the benefits, which is our mandate. And I, I think even within the sort of the, um, the context in, in which we operate and the guidance that we have, that we can find opportunities like the Small Grants Program, which actually was funded at the, at the same time as the Jeff was funded. We, it was one of our first programs, and the Small Grants Program really has shown us what is what is possible uh, in terms of financing to uh, providing direct financing to civil society, local communities, as well as indigenous peoples. And I, uh, so we have then the Small Grants Program and then with the ICI, we yet again are sort of looking for new opportunities to find mechanism to finance indigenous peoples within the constraints that we have. And you could argue that, and, I, and what I think that what we'll learn here is that there are institutional challenges, of course, with setting up a program like this. But I wanted to actually focus a little bit on the presentations that were there, the first uh, uh, um, presentations with you that are working on the ground that are receiving the financing. And what, what struck me was really a lot of the learning that we have to do in terms of the, the focus of the work that you're doing. I picked up a lot of the, the importance around land tenure, the securing of rights for indigenous peoples, recognizing rights, helping to secure rights. Those, those are really important parts. I also heard the, the, the importance of um, uh, on uh, really promoting women in decision making, making sure that we, women are giving the space, the capacities to to do their work. So, I, so you so you so land tenure, gender equality, and then I also picked up very much on the issue on youth and indigenous 
people's youth and the importance of supporting those because basically these are going to be, those are the future of any indigenous uh, people's communities today. And so one of the things, that I'm, so as we are moving in Jeff, Jeff 8, we are, of course, continuing and expanding our small grants program. We are even opening up new, two new initiatives that really is going to provide additional financing for indigenous peoples, local communities, youth, and women. And we are also then continuing, of course, with the implementation of the ICI and learning around what we have to do there. Uh, we have uh, launched a number of new initiatives, uh, like, for example, during our assembly, we launched the, the Inclusive Assembly Challenge Program that really provides direct financing also to local um, uh, organizations and, and indigenous peoples' organizations. And we, so we are, within the, the context that we're operating, really pushing forward with a, a lot of these things. But I wanted to end, and I know that I probably don't have so much time. It is not only about having specific targeted programs. It is really about looking, at, like if you think about the Jeff, we, we sit on a lot of financing. Financing for biodiversity, and now with the biodiversity, the new biodiversity fund, we are financing over a lot of different uh, areas. And what we shouldn't forget is really trying to pull the lessons uh, across um, so that we, c lessons on how do we make sure that the projects and programs that we are financing through all of this, these uh, in, um, programs that we really are learning from the good lessons learned that you were talking about, really how do you make sure that the initiatives from indigenous peoples, from local communities, are really drawn up so that the governments are really seeing that, yes, we need to do these projects. What, how, what are the mechanisms for making sure that the voices of the needs and the interests of communities are really raised at the national level so the, the projects will come to, to bear? And then how do you make sure that when the projects come, when they start in the design, how do we make sure that, that indigenous peoples and local communities are really part of the design? Not as an afterthought when everything is set, the objectives are set, the results framework is set, the financing is set. And those, so there are a lot of lessons learned in, from the ICI and from the Small Grants Program on what works. And this also has to be across, um, our other projects and programs if we are about to really get more financing to uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. Thank you. Great, thanks Gabriella. Um, and I know we're short on time now, but maybe a couple of takeaways. Um, during this COP, and uh, we're sort of halfway through, you will probably hear about 10 other sessions yeah. regarding direct access for indigenous peoples and local communities. And it's a trend, right? It's a trend for this discussion. And I think we really do need to learn from the leadership. There was a number of reports that have been launched uh, the Forest Funders Group launched a report. The Shandy Initiative launched a report yesterday about what's working and what's not. But I still think we need to get under the hood, and I really would think it'd be a great challenge to look at really what we're learning under the multilateral hood, right? And how we can, you know, we just heard the big announcement yesterday among the funds, right? The Jeff, the, the, uh, the GCF, the Adaptation Fund, uh, the SIF, et cetera. And how, how can you really harmonize across those to make that access and that climate finance more efficient, more effective when you get to those when you get to those elements. So maybe I'll leave it there, but it is a trend, and I think, I know I've been in multiple sessions this week, including chairing them, but I think we really do need to pull those lessons out, but also not just the lessons, but transform the institutions. Multilaterals, institutions like my own, Conservation International, and also help indigenous institutions move forward in their, in their efforts. So I wanna thank you all um, for attending. I, we're out of time now, but we're happy to take questions on the side here if anyone has them, and thank you. Thank you for our interpreters as well. Much appreciated.